This is, I'm going to move us from 1975 till the present, and I'm going to measure and illustrate the number of computing units sold of a particular platform. Now, the thing to bear in mind is that these, this is a logarithmic chart, so we, this is 10,000 unit, this is 100,000, this is 1 million, above that, and all the way up to, um, all the way up to a billion at the very top. So bear in mind that each line here represents 10 times more. And so the, the, the picture that emerges when you start to look at computers, first of all, just before I continue, this is about personal computers or microcomputers as they used to be called. Um, and when they began in the 1970s, they were really around these brands, these Apple II and uh, some brand like TRS-80, which we don't remember much of, but uh, we also have here Atari, uh, and we have the famous Commodore uh, that comes into the picture. Um, and the PC, which started in 1981, was selling about 240,000 uh, uh, units by 1982. So this is the sort of scale in the, in the, in the hundreds of thousands of units. And there wasn't any computer making, uh, sort of selling at one million at that point yet. And what was happening is that there were many platforms, if you want to, they weren't called that back then, but there were many types of computers. There were, like I said, the PC, the Commodore, the Apple, the Atari, the TRS-80. But notice how by 1984, which is when Macintosh launched, famous Mac uh, uh, commercial ran in January 1984, telling us that 1984 will not be 1984. And, and the PC at the time was just hitting 2 million units, but it, was, it wasn't the number one platform. It was actually uh, number two behind Commodore. But it was rising very rapidly. And notice how a line on this scale means exponential growth, right? So we have, you know, bearing, bearing in mind the, 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 the logarithmic progression here. But what's interesting is when the Macintosh launched, and here it is at 370,000, it was the fourth uh, most, uh, most prominent computer platform, but it didn't do very well. In fact, it went, it went down. It was, it was a failure, um, 200,000 units in the second, second year. And at that, that very moment, when, when uh, Apple was, was touting the virtue of being against the, the, the IBM Big Blue, um, PC had just reached number one. And it, that meant 3.7 million units. And what happened is the first wave of platforms failed. The second wave began. Some of these early entrants began to sort of uh, rejoin the race with new, new generation computers, as Apple did again with the Mac. And by 1986, this was the picture. It was still quite vibrant, quite a lot of contenders, although the difference between the bottom and the top was an order of magnitude in terms of units. And uh, by 1988, quite a long time, or more than a decade after that uh, initial in launch of, of <coughs> microcomputers, PC was pulling ahead quite a bit. Commodore was starting to fade, and the Macintosh was starting to, again, rise. But the others weren't doing so well, and in fact, were beginning to fade. So um, Steve Jobs had left here after after the Mac, and then he launched the next computer. Notice how many orders of magnitude lower it was. It was indeed uh, a failure, and the Apple II was still around uh, only 100,000 units, however. And then ultimately, by by the mid 1990s, slightly right. This was right before the uh, the uh, launch of Windows 95. Um, this was the situation. The PC was well ahead, uh, actually an order of magnitude above the Macintosh and everyone else was fading and actually disappeared by 1995. Windows, uh, at this point, established itself 
as the dominant platform. But it wasn't the only one, there was this other player. Now, an interesting thing at this moment is that more or less people knew what the future would look like. It was predictable at this moment, right? These were all gone. The, the cycle time of innovation was over. This was quiescence. And in fact, it was lasting this way. It looked like it would become a one horse race. The Macintosh began to fail in the late 90s. The PC was still rising very, very rapidly. The, the order of magnitude is more like two orders of magnitude at this point. And so it looked like it was over. In fact, there wasn't much going on in the late 90s. And um, the Mac came back a little bit with the iMac, a little bit of, of, a, of a refresh there. But it was still far, far below the PC. And in 2000, this was the situation. It was game over. However, interesting thing happened was Nokia came in. And it wasn't the only one. I should point out that during this lull, during this period when it looked like there was no innovation happening, there was something happening. It was called the PDA. It was these mobile devices that didn't have data connectivity, but they were connected using cables. And they were first the Palm Pilots in 1996 then Windows CE in 1998. And in fact, Nokia built on top of it Symbian, which was uh, also a PDA operating system from Scion, that came in also in the late 90s. And Nokia s simply launched a mobile device that had the same operating system generated, developed in the 90s, but had data connectivity. And so, so this was the birth of the smartphone in uh, 2001 with the Symbian Series 60. And the interesting thing about this launch is notice when it came out, it actually came out almost at the peak level of the previous generation of PCs. The thing about this graph to me isn't so much that we see patterns of rise and decline, but rather when you see a new platform emerging in the later stages, it emerges at much higher volumes than before. In other words, sort of quantity has a quality of its own here. And in fact, you can see how rapidly things rose. Here we have RIM, although they were out earlier, I didn't have data beyond that. But RIM, RIM was selling half a million units, Nokia 5 million units, an order of magnitude more, already overtaking the second largest uh, PC platform within, within uh, two years. And indeed, we had many entrants coming in, it's going to be hard to see some of them here. We have, for example, Linux-based devices, which eventually became Android. We have things like, um, we have things like um, Windows Mobile, which was the evolution of, of Windows CE from the 90s. And, and many, many new entrants. Uh, iPhone began here at this point in 2007. The iPad and the iPod soon to follow. And then they all rose exponentially. Although, in the, again, we had some fading going on from the very early entrants. You see Nokia peaking at this point in 2009 in the smartphone space. Some of the RIM devices begin to slow down. Windows Mobile slows down as well. And so this is only about four years ago. And, and, yet, and yet Android launched at this point. And then we had some other contenders like Android tablets and, um, and even uh, you know, some Asian operating systems coming out. But this is what happened at the end of 2012. Very similar pattern, although amplified amplified by orders of magnitude and actually the proliferation of platforms. We, had a, we, had a, we have an abundance of choice at this point. And the, the very top selling mobile platform, which is behind here, you can almost see it, it's Android. And you can, I'm gonna to try to zoom in a bit here. You can see how Android at this moment, sorry, Android has reached uh, parity with the PC marketplace. Although slightly more fragmented than the PC, there's still a huge amount of volume involved there in the Android space, and it's growing much more rapidly than the PC. So this is a brief history of computing. I would say that, in fact, it's an incomplete history because we had, before this era, we also had many computers. We also had mainframes. When I was in Australia, I met a gentleman there, also the ThoughtWorks event pointed out that in Australia, he was servicing 95 different sites running mainframes. In the mainframe era, in, in, the, in the other eras before, they were also down here, if you can imagine. And they're one order of magnitude lower than the PC. So at, at, this is part of a continuum that we had large, very large computers selling in the tens per year, many computers selling in the hundreds, perhaps thousands. 
microcomputers selling in the millions, and then finally now we're in the phase of super intimate computing going into the billions. The interesting thing, and this is just a quick illustration of how quickly this happened. I'm going to actually play this as an animation, and you can see how very rapidly Android rose from, from uh, 2009. This is a, the PC market, and then you can see how quickly, from 2009, how quickly Android rose. And this is a, a linear scale. And here you see the iPhone and the iPad, which if they were to be stacked on top of each other, they would also over, overtake the, the Windows platform rather quickly. And just another illustration, uh, here I'm going to just show you how um, we can look at the vendors involved in this market. This is units shipped, uh, actual number, not logarithmic scale. And then here we, here we have the, the HP, Acer, Dell, Toshiba, and other vendors. And, and this is the PC market that made up that total figure of PCs. And on the very top here, I have the Macintosh. This is the Mac in comparison to Windows. And this is what an order, the order of magnitude difference in volumes. So 3.3 million. We have here the dip, the, the, uh, the credit crunch, the credit crisis. Um, other PCs are here. And this was the picture of the PC. And the interesting thing would be, if you go forward, this is a quarterly data. We had a good recovery in 2009 after the, after the crisis. But the remarkable thing that happened, if you look at it this way, is the launch of the iPad. But the amazing thing about the iPad, which is this purple dot here, the iPad, when it launched, is 3.2 million. But in that quarter, the Mac was 3.4 million. So here was a computing platform, a modest one, not a very high performance one. But it's one that could be compared for certain things, like giving presentations, to a PC. And it launched in the very first quarter as many units as the Macintosh, which has been around since 1984. And keep, in, keep an eye on this red line, because I call this the boundary layer between this layer, this age, and the new one that, that rose above it. And here we begin to see, only a few quarters later, fourth quarter 2010, the Amazon, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the Android, we do have Amazon also later on, but we, we had Android launching uh, quite soon after the, uh, the uh, iPad. And the numbers are already increasing to the point where they have 7 million iPads uh, uh, in the market within, within uh, less than uh, one year. And I'm going to just fast forward this and you can see what happened. Keep, in mind, keep, it, keep your eye on this red line. This is the boundary layer. Notice how flat everything below it is and where all the growth is on top of that. And this is just comparing tablets to PCs, combining it into one market. And you see that it's a computing market that continues to grow, even though there's sort of a PC market stagnation. And in fact, the, the, this goes into the last quarter here. We had this tremendous drop, both sequential, but also more, more damningly, year on year, where the, Mac, uh, the, the PC market fell, uh, according to IDC, the steepest drop it's had since they've been, they started measuring the market in 1994. And indeed, during that same time, we had a sequential drop in, in, in tablets, but a very good year-on-year -year growth in that market, if you were to think about that uh, as a measure. And so we had, and now Windows, on top of things, you can see it here, that Windows and Microsoft has decided to respond to this quite a, in 2010 quite, quite quickly, and now has a, a product in the marketplace. But the problem is for these other vendors, the, the, the HPs and the Dells of the world, they haven't really a solution for that, for that disruption right now. And this is the same picture seen, however, as uh, a share where the total is 100%. And you can see the, 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 the crunch that's happening. And this is, this is actually, uh, again, only PCs and tablets, not including smartphones. If we did actually look at smartphones, this is one way to look at it. Here's a PC market, 200 million in 2005. Everyone has been quite happy that it keeps growing, 300 million in 2008. And here was the launch of, of, of the iPhone. And this is, if I were, we were to add iPhone together with Android, this is what the smartphone market looks like, and the smartphone and tablet market. But in 2008, this was the gap. 
and notice what happened. This is this is as of the end of last year, and obviously this there's been no slowing, really dramatic slowing going on. So tablets launched here now at this level, and uh, most likely they will overtake the PC in another few years. But already the phone space is is thriving. The interesting thing, though, is that although the phone market, uh, the phones seem to be disrupting the tab, the, the the computers, the PC, the, the phone vendors haven't done all that well. And I wanted to sort of put this out as well. You saw the, the disruption happening to Dell and to HP and others. But what about the the phone guys? I was working at Nokia, hopeful that that Nokia would be a disruptor. But in fact, if you look at, at the vendors of phones, they haven't. They look very much like the PC space. There's been a lot of consistency over the years. With you know, there's been some up and ups and downs due to the economy. But this is what's happened to PC vendors. We have Nokia here in brown, Samsung, other um, Apple launching and looking very very small here. This blue area. Here's LG in red. Uh, uh, you know, the smartphones separate from Nokia main main phones and Sony Ericsson and others. HTC is in here as well somewhere in red. But this is what the phone market looks like, and it doesn't look all that different. It's these strata, these layers and layers of, of vendors, all of them sort of still in there, although there's quite a bit of, of turnover in some of the smaller players. We have some, 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 some change. But the main, the main uh, uh, volumes are still with the larger players. And Apple, as you can see, has grown now to the point where it's about 9% of the market overall. This is just all phones. But if we look at smartphones, it's a different story. In 2007, when the Apple, Apple launched the iPhone, they were here, 2.3 million units. And here was Nokia selling almost 20 million units in that quarter. This is Q4 2007, the, the, the holiday quarter. And RIM was 3.9. RIM was, was, was doing much better than Apple. And it looked pretty much steady state for a while. There wasn't a lot of drama. HTC was in there. 2.9 million. So this is a year after the iPhone launch. Now, in Motorola, although they weren't, they weren't uh, uh, dramatically in there, they came in with, with the Droid brand later on in 2008. And so we had, we had this, this situation in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the smart market. It didn't look like really there was a lot of disruption. Notice there's one player missing from this picture. And that's actually Samsung. You might, if you notice this little spot here, that's Samsung back then. And what happened since? This is the smartphone market from 2009 to present. I noticed I, I just accelerated from 2009. This was only a few years ago. And the drama here is far, far more substantial. And this is Samsung today, by far the largest. 71 million units in the last quarter. Apple, 37 million. Uh, people mention all the time that Apple lost its dominance. It never had it. Apple was never number one. Um, it was Nokia was lost its dominance. They were a market leader throughout this period and well before as well. And, and we had a lot of turnover at the very top as well with, with a lot of these players. Really, uh, the Motorola, the LG, the uh, Sony, all of those players really not getting any action at all. And so the, the amazing thing is actually, this is seen as a line chart, the same story. Here's Nokia on top, all the way through to 2009, RIM number two, Apple and HTC. And then we had a situation where in, in, uh, in there's Sony outselling Samsung. Samsung only joining 3.2 million units, only in Q2 2010. So three years ago, Samsung got into the market, and today that's where they are. So it's not that Apple has been failing. These, these uh, wobbles that we see here are the product launch cycles. And since they have only one phone, really, that they, that they go to market with, then you see a lot of volatility, whereas Samsung has dozens of phones uh, in the market launching many times a year. So that's the situation in smartphones. We have sort of one, two, and then everybody else. And as a result, what's happening is, if we look at this, is, this is the, the market share in terms of smartphones, we see this dramatic turnaround. It's not looking at all as quiet as it is. Is that this area, which is the area of, of share, for, went from Nokia to Samsung, and sort of 
apples in rising, but in the middle. <coughs> and uh, in terms of revenues, this is the picture here. The overall market grew for all phones, well, quite quite nicely. But the the, the companies which gain all the all the uh, all the revenues are really only two. Again, Samsung and, Mike, and, and Apple. And in terms of operating profit, this was a situation in 2009. Nokia had lost almost everything, getting only 20% share by 2009, and Apple getting 40% share in 2009. And this is the situation as of the end of last year. It hasn't changed dramatically to Q1. I haven't updated Q1, but, but it, it's a little bit, uh, Apple's gone down a bit, uh, Samsung's gone up a bit, but that was to be expected given the launch cycles. But those two players now have 100% of the profits available in the market. 100%. And so, what does this all mean? And you know, what, why am I dumping all this on you? Um, as I said, qual quantity has a quality of its own. What, what's happening is that the phone market, the, we, we used to call this convergence, the idea that phones and computing devices become one. And it's not just the convergence of form factors or computers in, 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 in sort of in the technical sense but rather the fact that consumers are not distinguishing between these two platforms. And they're using them for very similar things. And to give you an idea of how big the market is, this is what the phone market, which I think is a superset of all computing markets, this phone market looks like, it looked like in 2010, there were three estimates uh, in millions of units. So here we have, on this scale, the very top is uh, uh, 2.4 billion units uh, per year. So again, this is yearly data. And there are some estimates, nobody's quite sure how many phones were sold in a particular year, but this is four different estimates for 2010. <coughs> one is Credit Suisse, uh, another one is IDC, another one is Gartner, and another one is Nokia. So there's a little bit of a range, so about 200 million delta between the top and bottom. But these, these are all in pretty much agreement that this is the trend. And this is the data as of 2011. Uh, we don't have uh, Nokia data. We have a, a few analysts projecting uh, or, or expecting 2012 data, and then going forward 2013. And this is the trend of the expectation. Again, bearing in mind there might be some variance, but we're looking at 2017, 2.3 billion units expected at the upper end of this range. That's per year, 2.3 billion units. Now, of course, not all of those are smart. Um, if I took that top estimate and broke it down between smart and non-smart, this was the situation in 2012 where um, we had an estimate of about 1.2 billion units sold uh, as, as non-smart devices, the green area, and then smart devices here in blue at uh, 700 million in 2012. And this is the expectation for 2013. I think I just read that uh, uh, globally it's, it's about, the sales rate is about 50% which is what this reflects. So into Q1 is the inconsistent. So uh, about you know one-to-one -one relationship at this point. But if we move forward, <coughs> smartphones are likely to become the uh, dominant. Now I'd like to point out that if you look at the blue area and you measure the top of it, notice how it's higher, far higher than overall phone phones sold in 2009. In fact, the, the total here, 1.7 billion, is, uh, not, is about what, what 2010 volumes were. So smartphones may not be the whole market, but they are bigger than the whole market used to be in 2010. And that's not a, that's not a small number, 1.7 billion units. If you were to look at it also in terms of who is using this, this is the total number of unique, unique subs in the world, unique mobile users, and that's 4.4 billion people in 2011. And that's expected to grow. And here's smartphone users, 700 million. And then as we again go forward to 2017, the expectation is, again, not particularly controversially, I would add, but we expect 6 billion users of phones in general, of which 3.9 billion will be smartphone users. Now think about that. 4 <coughs> billion users will be smartphone users, and we have 4 billion phone users back here. So we, we might argue, well, it's not everybody. But it would be would have been everybody a few years ago. 
And again, the same type of data in terms of penetration. If you look at um, the, the uh, smartphone uh, and the regular phone as number of, uh, as percent of population, we had 67% of the human population having a phone back in 2011. And again, that was growing. So the smartphone is expected to be 49% by 2017. Again, not far from what it used to be a few years earlier. So as if smartphones were everyone who had a phone in 2009, <coughs> back here, this is um, uh, nearly 50% of the, of, the, of the market. And I wanted to throw focus on one particular market where we have a lot more data about how that adoption is going. Here we see in the US market, this is the blue area is the penetration of smartphones, and the green area is the rest, which means people who are not using smartphones. And we can see that it crossed over 50%. This is according to Comscore data surveying 30,000 people. And it shows that they crossed over 50% in, uh, in late in, in August 2012. But there hasn't been a slowing afterwards. This is the rate of growth, which is the number of new additional smartphone users per week. And you can see that it's been very steady. This is a the black line is showing the, the trend. And it's, it's, it hasn't really de uh, uh, decelerated after reaching 50%. So it's, it's, you know, the question is, these things go in terms of an S-curve, and you're always looking for that inflection point where you go from acceleration to deceleration. And it hasn't happened yet. This is, this is still part of an S-curve. It went like this, and it's going to somehow flatten out. And we'll see what, where, where, that, where that flattens out. But my expectation is, at least in this market, that it's going to be nearly 100%. In fact, Unlike the, Swiss, uh, the Credit Swiss data, I think that it, it, this might go even higher with smartphones, mainly because actually vendors are not motivated to make anything else. And they will increasingly slow down the development of non-smart devices, except perhaps for a few, like perhaps Nokia will find it profitable. But if you look at Samsung, number one phone company today, and number one smartphone company today, they've switched their portfolio almost 100%. Uh, uh, from in 2010 being uh, uh, mostly uh, non-smart devices to now being mostly smart devices. And in fact, I think over 60% of their mix today is, uh, is smart, and I think they're going to try to push it all away. And if you, if you even listen to Chinese vendors like ZTE or Huawei, they are also saying we want to be a smartphone company. And these are entrants, not, not incumbents. So very much uh, uh, the low end, and the high end are currently focused on this market. So it may be just like in the television market where we went from one generation to the next, like we did from black and white to color and from CRT to LCD. We had an avalanche and sort of a tipping point in which you couldn't go find any more of the older generation, if, even if you wanted it. The vendors simply found no economic incentive to deliver on the old product, even though there were people interested in buying it. And so, in fact, it's not that this market may tap out at 80%. It may tap out at 100% simply because you can't get the old. And if that happens, then in fact, that CS, those CS projections you've seen earlier might actually be uh, conservative. And what's happening while this is all, all this is going on is that the basis of competition is moving not just in selling, in, from selling devices, but as you can imagine, it's and actually what you do with the device once you purchased it. And I, I was, as Jeff Bezos likes to say, is like, we want to be paid when you use the device, not when you purchase it. And that's not true just on, on, on in case of Amazon. Everybody wants that same picture to happen. And this is a, 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 a slide or a, a presentation I call um, the, the race of, of ecosystems and the race to one billion units. And here I have various platforms. Um, and I have them in terms of cumulative units post-launch. So how many quarters after the launch of a particular platform, how many, uh, how many users did they get? And again, this is on the logarithmic scale. The very top is one billion. Uh, cumulative users, and on the horizontal axis, I have quarters after launch, and the limit at the very end of that is 44 quarters or 11 years. So you can say, who has gotten to a billion in less than a decade? That's approximately what this graph shows. And it's, the, again, on the log scale, so everything that's linear here is actually logarithmic or, or uh, exponential, and then you have these types of patterns 
emerging, where a lot of platforms are sort of vying for the race, and whoever is on top is the one that's accelerating most quickly to get there. And I, I, I threw in just for, you know, over the, over the many times I've published this data, people would suggest to me, why don't you add another platform? Because surely it's competitive. And, uh, you know, we had things like <coughs> mobile phone platforms like iMode. Uh, of course, the, the phone guys are all in there like, you know, uh, uh, Nokia and, and Windows Mobile and so on. But we also have things like Apple TV, Wii, which is a, a game platforms, and also the Xbox platform. And, and, and here, by the way, this dot represents the PC market back when it started in the 1970s. And, and, and yet, here's Android now very quickly rising to the top. In nine quarters, there were 75 million units sold. In nine quarters, there were 57.5 million iOS devices sold. And, and in comparison, you can see how much more rapidly the new platforms are accelerating versus the old. And this is the number of users again. So what matters is how quickly you can, you can gain them. Uh, there are clearly times when a platform begins to slow down. Um, we see this, we, we saw this with IMO. There are also, Netsky, here's AOL back in the 90s. And indeed, one of the, the one of the platforms I was asked to add, add late, later on was Facebook, because Facebook is actually something you can write plat, uh, apps for. And Facebook is, 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 is remarkably strong, and it, it, it reached 300 million in, in 22 quarters. In fact, um, we ran out of, of data because these aren't old enough yet, but this is how Android and iOS um, are running right now towards a billion, but in fact, there is a winner in the sense that there was somebody who reached a billion, and that was Facebook, who did so in about 34 quarters. And here at the, at the bottom, this is still, keep in mind, that PC, which is the very first graph you saw. So this is another way to look at the world. And, and what it implies is a couple of things. One is that the trajectories here are fairly predictable. You can start to see when things slow down. And you can start to see when things won't slow down. The impressive thing to me is that these two winners here, at least on top, Android and iOS, seem to be in the trajectory for a billion in less than a, than a decade. There's no doubt about that. And remember, we are targeting four billion people. And they're going to consume something that's going to run an operating system. And so to suggest that on one hand, you have addressable markets of four billion, and you have contenders who are reaching towards one billion, that's not a stretch. One billion people in less than 10 years is not a, is not a stretch, but there's significant implications. That means that iOS, unlike the Macintosh, will definitely have a billion users, even if it's considered the loser. And Android, as the winner, will have multiple times more users than Windows ever did. Windows tapped out at about a billion users. And so you also have the potential of another entrant, a third or a fourth player, taking some market share, which is significant, which means hundreds of millions of users, simply because the numbers are so big today and the market is so diverse. So I wouldn't count BlackBerry and Windows Phone quite, out quite yet, although they may not gain the 20, 30 percent market share that iOS has today, they may not be completely out of the picture, given the fact that they could still gain hundreds of millions of users. But clearly, there are billions of, billions of users that are going to be using these, these prominent platforms that we see today. Uh, this is just another way to look at the same data. This is, if I didn't use a log scale, this is what it looks like. Much harder to, to spot the pattern, but, you, but it, it's, it's more, perhaps more, more, more spectacular in its, sort of in its explosiveness. Um, and, and one other thing that, that I need to point out is that when you look at phones, the dynamics are very different than PCs. Very, the, the growth implies certain things. Here are the iPhone generations, and this is my estimate of how many phones were shipped by generations. So here's iPhone 1 and where it peaked. Here's, here's the iPhone uh, 3G. Here's the iPhone 3GS, and there's the iPhone 4. And you can see how many more units they had to produce. And this is one of the issues that we are starting to run into as an obstacle to growth, is that there isn't enough production capacity to deliver. Here's the iPhone uh, uh, 4S when it launched. You can see how they had to ramp production, doubling at least, in some cases, more than doubling each time. 
Of course, the five didn't do as well, although partly it's, there's a, a, a launch, uh, splitting the launch over two quarters there. But also we had a, an, an increasing uptake of iPhone 4S, uh, meaning that, that was, the price was dropped and there was still a lot of demand for it, which ate into the, the five. But this is the pattern of growth for the iPhone, and, and, and presumably, we don't have the data, presumably the Galaxy looks very similar. There is a question about how sustainable that is. So I'm gonna wrap up with, with one more chart. Everything until now has been market data. This is, this is the financial, financial picture. And what I'm showing here is the sales and profits of the contenders in this, in this ecosystem battle. This is Google and Microsoft sales by segment as they report it. And you can see how during the, the epoch, this is the modern epoch of, of, uh, of smartphones. So starting when the iPhone launched, that was sort of time zero. The iPhone launched and what happened in the time since. Notice how Samsung and, 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 and Microsoft looked in that time frame. And here we have Apple in comparison, the third stack over there. And then we have Samsung in comparison to that. And then we have, as a, as a sort of a control, we have Amazon, also a beneficiary of the mobile revolution. And there you see their performance. And here, by the way, we have the gray area is the iPhone, the blue area is the iPad, and then iTunes, the Mac is the blue. And here, in, in the case of, of Samsung, also gray is their mobile phone division, and then we have their other divisions like semiconductors, displays, consumer electronics, and so on. And in contrast to that, we also have their operating income. This allows us to compare. So this is in, uh, profit before tax. And you can see the ratio between these two, everything's on the same scale. So the ratio between these two is profitability or margin. And here you see how much more profitable uh, Microsoft is relative to its sales. And here we can see what Apple has been doing and where its profits are coming from. And then we can see how Samsung is doing. And we cannot see how Amazon is doing because there's nothing there. But of course, that makes it the most valuable as far as the stock market is concerned. And this, of course, is the least valuable. Um, but the point isn't about what markets think. The point is, how did these companies capture value from mobile? And what happened is, the curious thing from a theory point of view, is that the two players that seem to have the most success, meaning growth, have been actually hardware companies, or at least they seem to be. They're selling hardware, but they're probably capturing value in some other way. And the companies that we would have thought would be the disruptors, in fact, Microsoft has been trying to disrupt mobile since 1998. They've been trying to launch a mobile operating system that would be the Windows of mobile, literally called Windows Mobile, since the late 90s. And they haven't prospered much at all. Their stock has been completely flat, but in, even so, there's no visibility within this revenue structure of any, uh, any income from mobile and none here either, which is their profits. Nor, I might add, is there any evidence of success from mobile in Google. Even though they have the most valuable platform on the planet in terms of users, it is zero impact in terms of their bottom line. This, by the way, this red area is the only one we can attribute to mobile, and that's Motorola. And it has almost no impact in their profits. In fact, it has a negative impact in their profits. And so whereas we might argue that having Android has allowed them to maintain the trajectory, it would imply that Android is a purely defensive move. It meant that it is there so that they don't fail rather than it is there because they shall succeed. Maybe it's too early. Maybe six years is too soon to, to write the story on that. But it's curious that as far as mobile is concerned, there's a dilemma here. I mentioned the fact that the phone guys who were incumbent in the mobile space have been mostly displaced, except for Samsung. I've noted that, in fact, the platform players who were incumbent in platforms and doing rather well, I would add, with the case of Android, haven't captured value. And finally, that these companies, which would have seen, being, you know, they've been seen as archaic, 
selling and bending metal and doing things like that have captured by far the most value. And even uh, a, a company like Amazon, like a sort of a control point where we, we, we see uh, an innovation in terms of distribution and sort of just riding on top of everything else, they have had success as far as sales, but not yet of profits, if we were to look at this bottom line. And the market may be pessimistic on the prospects of these players, but they were pessimistic on the prospects of these players all along. At no point during this period of time did, did Apple obtain a P ratio above the S&P 500. So Coca-Cola, if I may use that as a proxy, was seen as much more valuable and long-term than Apple ever was during all of its ascent. So that's a dilemma for you guys to think about. Why is it that when you do have disruption, it's very hard to capture, to hold on to the tiger by its tail? It was hard for me because I was at Nokia at a time when I thought absolutely in 1999 that mobile was the future, mobile computing was the future, and my anticipation was that this is exactly what would happen, what did happen, but it was the wrong horse. So with that, I'd like to sort of let you think about it throughout the day, think how you can benefit from this, and think about what, what, what actually happened here.